Hi, thanks for joining us today. If this ministry has impacted your life, we want to hear about it. You can send us your story at amen at vnchurch.com. Also, we would love if you would partner with us financially. You can go to vnchurch.com and click the Give Online or text your donation amount to Father's Day, all of those of you who are fathers, and we certainly celebrate that. Those of you who are online, if you're fathers, we are, we're glad that you're with us. Of course, everybody, we're glad that you're with us. We are uh, at the very end of a series that we started nine weeks ago on Easter about relationships, and we've been talking about how important that is, talking about techniques and things that we can do and strategies, but today we're going to talk about something that ties it all together and actually is more important than all the other ones. This one is the big one, but let me just begin by asking you a question. If you were to answer this or fill in this blank, how would you fill it in? My life aim is to what? You know, and it might be different. You know, maybe you'd say, oh, to be successful, to make a lot of money, to be famous, to you know, have a great body, uh, to have my kids have a dry diaper. You know, I mean, all, I don't know, you can throw it in however you want, but, but people have different, to be comfortable, some other ones, uh, happiness, have security, recognition, to be well-known, to have approval. The list goes on. Now, you, all of us have some kind of driving life purpose, some driving aim. Sometimes we're not aware of it, uh, because it's subconscious. But here's how you can identify it if you're not sure what it is for you. Next time you have some choices, like you go out at night, and you have a, and if, see, if, you're ta- if your chief aim is fun, then when you have two choices, you're going to choose what's most fun, or at least what you think will be the most fun, right? If, you're, if your driving aim is security, you're going to choose what's the safest option. If your driving uh, force is, you know, your driving aim is, is uh, you want to uh, be well known, you're going to choose the option that gets you in front of people. And, and, and see, it's going to, when we make choices, we make choices based on our, this, this life aim, this driving purpose we have. Now, the Bible says when you are a Christ follower, when you put your faith in Christ, that your life aim should be a particular thing. One thing, actually, the Bible talks about. If you take out your outline, in 1 Corinthians 13, it talks about it quite a bit, and then summarizes it uh, as it goes into chapter 14. It says, it says, make love your greatest aim. Let's say that out loud together. Ready? Make love your greatest aim. That's what it should be. Love is the main focus. Love is the driving. That's the undercurrent of all that we do. And the reason is because you can be successful, but without love, it doesn't mean a whole lot. And there's plenty of people that are successful with their relationships or in a shambles. There's no love there. And and so they they live these shallow, empty lives or popular or all these things. You can fill in the blank there. So we want love to be our greatest aim. Why is that so important? Well, there's a lot of things that happen if you don't have love. Uh, even though we can spend our whole life trying to accomplish things or do things, and without love, it doesn't add up to a whole bunch. That's what First Corinthians says there when it's describing the impact of love. It says why. It says, uh, excuse me, why love is the greatest value. It says, without love, all that I say is ineffective. All that I say, and some of us can be wordy. All that I say, no matter what I say, he says here, if I speak. In the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. And so, and you know, we celebrate people that speak really well and have all this charisma, but if you don't have love, it doesn't mean a lot. And the Corinthians did the same thing. People that had great speaking voices, people that had lots of spiritual giftings, maybe they were speaking in tongues or did other kinds. And he's saying, hey, I'm, 
if, if you don't have love, that doesn't mean really a whole lot at all because love is what makes it so important. Sometimes people say, yeah, but, you know, I, I just, I got to tell it the way it is. <laughs> you know, I got to speak the truth. Uh, but the problem is, is if you speak the truth and there's no love, nobody really cares, right? People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And so you've got to be willing to share what you say in a loving way. The, how about the truth of God's word? There's not, that's truth. You know, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever should believe would have everlasting life, not perish. But if you say that mean, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. I mean, you're going, I, what, what? I mean, this doesn't even make sense, right? Jesus loves you. You better listen up. Well, hey, you gotta, there's got to be love in that. If there's no love, it can be truth. But here's the thing is, if it's not loving, we resist it. We resist it. It doesn't matter if it's truth. You go, well, hey, I don't really, there's not a lot of good communication at home. Was it possible that the communication you're doing is not very loving? You know, that you're not, you're not love Because when we love, when we say something in love, people tend to be more, they open up. They be, they're more receptive. They tend to listen better. If you want better communication, look no further than love. Saying what you say in love. Another thing is, without love, all that I know is incomplete. And sometimes we know so much and we're so happy and we're so, we're, we have so not, not much knowledge. We, knowledge is, is an idol in our country. And it was in the Greek days too. They were speaking, Corinth, Corinth was a, in, the, in the Greek uh, province there. And, and he's saying, hey, you know, I know you guys love knowledge and all. And we love knowledge today. He goes, but without love, it's just not, it's not a whole lot. He says, if I have the gifts of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, but have not love, I am nothing. He's saying, you, you could be a Phi Beta Kappa key holder. You could be a Mensa member. You could have so many degrees. They call you Dr. Fahrenheit. You know, that you've memorized the whole New Testament. You can quote it back and forth in three or four different translations. You can dice a theological hair 13 different ways. But if you don't have love, it doesn't mean anything. Love is, it trumps knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, makes us prideful. We think we're better than we really are. Hey, I got all this knowledge. I'm so smart. But love builds up. Love builds up. Now, we actually do love knowledge in our country and really all over the world. And, and there's, a, there's a knowledge boom happening. I don't know if you know this, but that all of the world's knowledge, all of the world's knowledge collected is doubling every 13 months. You go, Andy, how do you know that? Look it up. That's what all I did. I didn't know that last week. I know it today. But every 13 months. And, there, and IBM says with the, quote, Internet of Things, that it's, it's rapidly increasing and it's going to start doubling every 12 hours. All the world's knowledge. You can't keep up. That's so much knowledge, right? But let me ask you, with all of that knowledge we have, are we a more loving place to live? No. And are the man or men, you know, mankind or humankind's greatest needs, are they solved? Because people are hungry for more love. We don't need more knowledge. We have all this knowledge coming at us. We need love. Number three, without love, all that I believe is insufficient. All that I believe, my faith. And faith is important to us, right? And it is important, but only if it has love. He says, and if I have faith that can move mountains. Jesus talked about that. He said, hey, if you had the faith of a mustard seed, you could move mountains. Great things in your life could change. And he goes, but if you don't have love, he's kind of building on Jesus' teaching. I'm nothing. Now, sometimes in Christianity, we've kind of bought into this idea that what it means to be a Christian is you have this certain set of truths or beliefs or doctrines that you hold up. You know, I believe in Jesus. Well, I'm thankful for that. But you know, the Bible says that the devil believes in Jesus. Is that he's the son of God. And it's not working out too well for him. See, well, the question is, do you love Jesus? 
Is Jesus' love residing in your life, in your heart, in your soul? And are you expressing that love to other people? Christianity is a lifestyle, and it is a lifestyle of love. So I'm glad that you believe and that you have faith, but it needs love. Faith is important, but you have to have love. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through what? Through love, right? Through love. That's what matters. That's, that's what it means to be a Christ follower. Without love, all that I give is, is insignificant. All that I give, and we can give a lot. You know, and, and he says, here he's talking about more than tithing. He says, if I give all I possess to the poor, that's a good reason. I mean, that's a uh, noble thing to do, right? Everything I have, I'm giving it to the poor. Even if I do something as, main, as magnanimous as that, he says, but have not love. I gain nothing. We can be big givers. We can tithe and give beyond. But if we don't have love. See, giving is not always loving. You can give without love, but you can't love without giving. When you love, you are a giver. But you can give for different motives. Sometimes people give for prestige. They want to be recognized. You know, they want some plaque on the wall. They want their name emblazed in some brick, you know, or some, some, you know, in the sidewalk, or they're looking for that. They want recognition for that. Some people, they give uh, to, uh, for, to have power over people, you know, to control them. Sometimes parents do this with their adult kids. You know, they'll say, hey, yeah, we're going to get together. I'm paying for it all. Kids are going, yeah, that's so sweet. That's great. That's so kind of you. Yeah, well, here's the rules. You have to do this. You have to do this. You have to act like that. You have to live. You have to be in this situation. And you go, well, that doesn't sound like very much fun. Well, I'm paying. It's not very loving. It's for control. And parents do it all the time. Some people give out of obligation. Some people give out of guilt. There's all kinds of motivations to give. But when we give, if, if we give without love, he says, I gain nothing. It doesn't really... It's not really advancing what I really hope it would advance. I'm controlling people. I'm, doing, I'm, I'm relieving some guilt, all those kinds of things. And it says, is, is, uh, oops, uh, something went wrong here. Let me follow up on my notes here. Number five, pull out your outline. Okay. And then all, let me see, did I, it says, yeah, then all that I accomplish, without love, all that I accomplish is inadequate. It says, if I were burned alive, for preaching the gospel. There it is. If I were burned alive for preaching the gospel, but didn't love others. Now, so he's kind of like, he's laying it down, right? I mean, how can you get more than that? I'm, I'm going to lay my life down, you know. I'm going to be burned alive, which they did. In that day, they were burning Christians alive in Rome. He goes, even if I do that for advancing the gospel, not because I'm a criminal, but for advancing God's word. He goes, it would be of no value whatever without love. So we can do all these amazing things. You know, we, great accomplishments, and, but if it, there's no love. So you can see that here he's being repetitive. You know, and communicators do that, right? Without love, without love, without love, without love, without love. You know, you're, what you say, what you know, what you believe, what you give, what you do. Nada. It does not help. It doesn't, it's not really making a difference. You think it is, but eternity-wise, it's not. Kingdom-wise, it's not, it doesn't help. So what he's saying is, he says you can have the, the uh, brilliance of an orator. You can be smart as an Einstein. You can give like a philanthropist. You can, you can have faith of a miracle worker. And you can have the dedication of a martyr. But he says, none of it means anything if you don't have love. So love should be our chief aim. That should be, when we are making choices, we ask the question, what is the most loving thing to do? Most of all, let love guide your life. That should be what we're asking. Let love guide my life. That's what I want to guide my life. So how do you do that? In practical ways, how do you do that? Well, you know, the Bible is practical. And it'll teach us how to be a better lover. That's what I thought that'd get your attention. How to be a better lover. And so that's, that's what we're going to look at. Three things and then we'll close. Number one, 
accept others unconditionally. Nobody is perfect. I'm not, you're not. That's why we need this acceptance. We need a place where we can be ourselves as we're in process. And that's, that certainly the church should be a place where that, where that happens. Here the Bible says, accept one another then just as Christ accepted you in order to bring praise to God. So what is our motive? What's, the, what's our basis for accepting one another? He says, because of Christ. Christ accepted you. When I was 18 years old, I heard about the amazing love of Jesus Christ, that he died on the cross for me, that he gave his life for me, and that he loved me. And so I invited Christ into my life, but you know, I was a mess. I had all kinds of these things. I, had, I was harboring hatred in my heart. I was doing drugs. I was selling drugs. I mean, I was a mess. And, but he, it wasn't like, oh, you got to clean up your life first. It's like, just as you are, you know. And I'm so thankful. And the Bible says that when we invite Christ into our life, his spirit indwells us. He comes in. Now, you know, I was, I was thinking, Jesus would think, wait, well, man, that's dirty in there. You got to clean that baby up. I ain't, I ain't staying there. That's filthy in there. No, he comes in and he just accepts me. Listen, we need to provide a place like that for others. The, the world is filled with people that uh, will judge us on, 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 on our performance. Maybe you, maybe you experienced a church in the past where that was the case. You know, you came in and you didn't talk the way they wanted you to talk or they didn't, you, know, you didn't dress the way you wanted to dress. You didn't drive the right kind of car. All those kinds of things. You didn't, you, you didn't have the right political view. You know, this is a multi-ethnic church. Multi-ethnic, and we have, because of that, we have, you know, multi-racial, we have different beliefs. We have a lot of Republicans here. <laughs> we have a lot of Democrats. I reverse that on purpose, just to kind of throw you off. We don't have the same view, and then we come together in a small group. Say, okay, get along, have fun. Whoa, I mean... I used to do that as a kid when I was like in first grade. I remember getting my lunch boxes, one of those little metal ones. And I would get, me and another friend, we'd, he, he'd collect black ants and I'd get red ants. And then we'd throw them in together and see who would live. And they would fight to the death. And that was like our entertainment. I told you I'm sick. I told you I had problems. <laughs> Shouldn't surprise you. I got a lot of stories that are like, whoa, what are you doing up there, Andy? <laughs> and, and. And so when we decided back in 2003 we want to be a multi-ethnic church, a multi-racial church, we knew that this was vital, that we had to have an umbrella of grace because you're going to make mistakes. You're going to say stuff. And if you have a thin skin, you have a chip on your shoulder, I'm telling you, you're probably not going to do well here because people make mistakes, but we're trying and we're working at it. And so we, you know, it's not like you can't say anything, but you just got to realize people are going to say dumb stuff and say things that hurt your feelings, and it's part of, you know, but if you want, if you don't, if you want to have a safe environment, go find a place where everybody believes just like you do. Of course, you'll be alone, but there might be a church like that. I don't know. That's not this church. And so acceptance, man, we need that. We need that. We want to be a place where there's good news. The good news that Christ loves us and that he accepts us. He says, I love this verse. He says, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. I love that, that phrase up here. If it is possible. Sometimes it's not possible. You know what I'm saying? You try your best. You're accepting your love and you're reaching out. You're doing what you can. And you just get a lot of negative coming back. And so he says, hey, don't let that get. You can't control them. You can control you. So it's as far as possible as you can. You do your best, and then let, leave the rest with God. God will take care of it. You know, I get, uh, from time to time, emails, and I usually collect them. You know, feedback people give me. Some of it's positive, some of it's negative. But, you know, it's, sometimes it's conflicting. I'll get posts from social media. Some people say, oh, the music's too loud. Oh, the music's too soft. Oh, the preaching went too long. Oh, there shouldn't have been any preaching. <laughs> Or, or whatever. I mean, there's all, people have different views of things. And so we need a place where we accept one another. Now, sometimes there's, you know, at work or, you know, might be in, where there's obnoxious people. What do you do about that? 
Well, you know, people that deserve love the least need it the most. And so with obnoxious people, they're just reacting out of hurt and pain, stuff in their own life. And so we love them. Number two, if you want to be a better lover, encourage others. Encourage others continually. You're always encouraging, building people up. Look at this verse here. It says, therefore, encourage one another and build each other up just as, in fact, you are already doing it. I love this verse because he's like encouraging him as he's telling him to be encouragers. He's saying, hey, you're already doing it. You're doing a great job. Keep it up. Encourage. And here's two things that are true about every single person on the planet. Everybody has a hurt. Everybody has a pain in their life. And then number two is everybody needs encouragement. Everybody needs to be lifted up. Life's not easy. It's tough. And so we need that, and we should be that place where we're encouraging one another. You know, there's, the world's always trying to pull people down. We, shouldn't, we should be a place where we're encouraging them, lifting one another up. Yeah, you can do it. You can do it. If you love someone, you will always believe in him and always expect the best of him. Notice this. You always believe, expect the best. If you want to change somebody, most of us want to change somebody, Right? I wish they were a little different. Here's the, here's the key. Now, you can't, you, usually the way we try to do it doesn't work, right? They just, and they just dig in deeper. I'm not changing. But here's the way. Here's the secret to change somebody is you expect the best out of them. You treat them like you want them to behave. You believe in them. And they'll change. It, might, it takes a while sometimes, but it's slow. You know, in education circles, they call this performance expectation. And way back in the day, uh, a guy named Rosenthal, he came up with this, this study he decided to do where he went to this elementary school in San Francisco and he told the teachers at elementary school, so it was one teacher, but it was a two-year study, so it ended up being two teachers. And he told the teacher, he said, uh, I have this new test that we've created from Harvard that will predict which kids of yours are going to have a big jump in IQ in the next year or two. And we wanted you to be able to wear that. And they said, now, of course, there's no such test like that. But he gave him a basic IQ test. And then, and then when he collected it, he, he, just, it, he didn't use those. He threw them out. And then he randomly picked kids in the class, told, randomly. But then told the teacher of that random group, these are the kids that are going to excel in their IQ. They're going to grow. They're going to have this huge upward growth in their IQ in the next year or two. And so that's all he did. And then measured it after the first year and then with the next teacher the second year. And all of those kids had a much higher growth in their IQ than any of the other kids. And so then he was thinking, wow, look at that. Now, of course, many studies have happened since then to, to show that this is absolutely accurate. It happens every time. But what they found was when he started looking into it was um, that the teachers, it was the teachers, not the students. It was the teachers that made a difference, their expectations. He said the expectations of the teachers happened moment to moment, interactions with the kids in a thousand different invisible ways. He said teachers, for example, would give students that they expected to succeed more time to answer their questions, more specific feedback, more approval. They were constantly touching them, nodding, smiling at the kids more. He said it's these thousand different ways of treating people in small ways every day that made a difference. Well, listen, that can happen for you too. It's not just in the schoolroom, not the classroom. It's, it's in life. When you believe in somebody, when you expect the best of them, people start to change. Now, since it's Father's Day, I wanted to talk a little bit about that for a second, about some of you have had amazing fathers. Maybe your father's still alive, and your, and your father is like a hero to you. Now, I like the fact that it's Father's Day and not Hero's Day, because there's probably not too many, you know, hero dads. But there's some, and I think that's awesome. And listen, if you have a hero dad, you should honor him as such. You should honor him that way. But I know a lot of you, I know your stories, and m many, many of you have no father or your father left when you were just a kid. That was my situation. When I was in elementary school, my father said, no, thank you, left the family. He was physically abusive, emotionally abusive. And I've lived here for over 30 years. He's only visited me twice. I've gone almost every year, sometimes two times a year, and visited him. And, and so uh, he just didn't want that role. You know, he just, that wasn't his thing. But 
you know, when I became a Christ follower, I told you I came to Christ when I was 18. And the Bible said, I started reading the Bible, the Bible says, honor your father and your mother. And I thought, well, God, how can I do this? Because it's, you know, it's, sometimes it's harder for some of us than others. And, uh, and so I just try, I prayed for him. Like I said, I visited him, always made a point to go and talk to him and encourage him, sometimes share my faith with him. And one of the things I would do on Father's Day is almost, I think I always called him, but mostly I would always send him a card as well. That's not anything amazing, right? But it was hard for me. I would go to like a grocery store where the section's real small and I couldn't find one that, you know, because there's all these, you know, you were always there for me. I'm thinking, well, that doesn't work. And, you know, <laughs> you know, so I, I had to like pull out the big guns. You know, I had to go to like American Greetings or Hallmark, you know, where I had tons of selection. They put me in front of this huge, and I would just stand there for hours, you know, just, well, it felt like hours. It wasn't hours. But emotionally, it was, it was like hard on me because I'd read one card after another. Can't do that. No, that does, that's not my dad. I can't, you know. And then finally, I'd find one that would kind of like just barely make it. And I'll hold that one, see if there's another one. <laughs> I'd use, then I'd get like two or three after a long time there, and I'd kind of sift through them and, okay, this is the one I'll do, and then maybe just, you know, write something in it. And then a few years ago, I decided to get two. I thought I'll get the one that I think is where he's at now. This is the pro- but then I thought, you know, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray towards this. I'm not going to send this one because that's not really, it doesn't fit where he's at. But, but he's still alive. And I, wanna, I still, still want to believe for something better. And so I kept that one and I have a couple more. And I just, that's like part of the way I pray and part of hopefully how I'm treating him. And I'm trying to, you know, ex- Hey, I want, I'm going to treat you that way because I expect something great, something more. Now, it wasn't like way out there, but it was like one that I, you know, like could have sent but didn't. Some of you, that's what you need to do. You need, that's where you're at, and you need to do that. Maybe it's for your father. Maybe it's for your kid. Maybe you have a kid that's not where you want to be, where you want that kid, where your child to be. And you need to maybe do the same thing. Now, I love the greeting card, especially as a guy. I'm not always that good with, you know, words and all. You know, the, I love the greeting card thing. You know, I know they're kind of expensive, but they, they did all the work for me. I can just, like, give it. Say, That's how I feel, baby. <laughs> no, I don't do that. <laughs> just some of you are wondering. It's not that bad. So, but, but, I mean, it does help, right? You know, you can, like... Give a card, and, and so somebody's, you know, you write that, and you go, hey, man, that's how I feel. I'm going to pray towards that. So certainly that's something that we can do where we, when we love somebody, we, we, we move towards that direction. We care about somebody. Number three, without love, or with, with love, we want to serve people cheerfully. Certainly that's something we want to be doing is serving. Because, you know, Jesus, that's, that char- that's one of his great characteristics. Jesus, the Son of God. The king of kings, lord of lords, put a towel around his waist, got on his knees and washed people's feet. And then the dirt from their feet, he actually washed it with his own robe or dried it with his own robe, got that, that dirt on himself. And then they go, whoa, whoa, what's going on, Jesus? Why are you doing that? He goes, I'm serving you because that's what it means to be a Christ follower, that we serve and that we do it. This would be the, the key word. We do it cheerfully. We do it cheerfully. Notice says, each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. And so God's given you particular gifts and abilities and paths. You know, you have, you're, you're shaped a certain way with spiritual gifts, a heart, abilities, personality, experiences, all those. God doesn't waste anything. And he uses that. And we use that to serve others. God gave me a gift to preach, not for me, but for you. God gave you a gift, not for you, but for for me and for others. We use our gifts to serve. We use our abilities. Now, we're we're going to be generalists in our serving, but we also are specialists. And when you serve as a specialist, that's what you were wired to do. That's, That's where your joy and your cheerfulness will really come out. Where you can really, this is what I was made to do. I'm supposed to serve like this. It just feels good. It feels right. And we serve. It's part of what, what it means to be a Christ follower. As we serve, Jesus said, pick up your cross, deny yourselves, pick up your cross and follow me. It's not, you know, it's simple what we're talking about, but it's not easy. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's simple when you so accept others unconditionally and encourage others continually and serve others cheerfully. That's simple, it's easy to say, hard to do. 
hard to do. You will lead by a completely different model, Jesus says. The greatest one among you will live as the one who is called to serve others. That's the way we're supposed to lead. We're supposed to influence others. Now, in step three, we're in our growth track, which is growth track, step one is about getting part of the church, catching the vision. Step two is where we start to help you to figure out how you're designed, because your design reveals your destiny, how, how God wants you to use your life. And then in step three, which is immediately after this service, is about how to use your gifts to lead, to influence, to, 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 to be in your sweet spot so that you can serve other people in a way where it's cheerful and it makes a big impact, an eternal impact, really. And we get to do that together. So if you haven't taken step three, I want you to be part of that right after this. It's only an hour long. We'll watch your kids. We feed you all that. But come and be part of step three. You can just jump in. You can say, Andy, I haven't taken step one or two. That's okay. Come on in. We'd love to have you in there. What's our motivation? Here it is. Christ's love compels us. You can't do it on your own. The, the truth is human love wears thin, wears out. How do we get the kind of love that allows us to continually give out? You know, we're, because if we just do it in our own, what, you know what we're going to end up saying? Hey, what about my rights? Did you ever hear Jesus say that? If you've ever read the Gospels, he doesn't say that. He doesn't go around, hey, I got rights. No. So, Jesus' love, Christ's love compels us. That's what compel, causes us to, to be able to love other people when it's not all that easy, when it's just downright hard. In order to do this, we're wrapping up this series on relationships and loving others. In order to do this, you need, you really need two things. You need, you need to experience Christ's love for yourself. You just need that. You need God just to come and invade your space. Break off some of that chafing and that jaded parts of your life and soften you and cause it to come cheerfully and enthusiastically. And then you also need a group of people, believers, to do it with. It's not a solo deal. We need to encourage one another. We serve together in teams. That's why we're doing Serve Day. Saturday, July 13th in the morning. Right here, you just, or, or you meet wherever your small group's meeting. We're gonna, I love the fact that we get to do it together and we get to, to tell the community that's what we're about is serving. I mean, this is really what I want our church to be known for, not a building or preaching or music or any of those things. I want our church to be known. That place is a place where they accept you unconditionally, no matter what you're going through, no matter what your life space is, no matter your, 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 what pain you're going through. You're not going to be judged and turned away. I mean, man, they love you. And then they encourage you. They build up. Man, you don't hear bad news. They hear good news. They encourage you and build you up. And it happens individually as well. And they're always encouraging one another. And then they serve cheerfully. And I've heard that so many times when people come and they'll visit our church. They'll say the very first day, they have a smiling face. Somebody's serving them. But we go out to the community as well, like on Serve Day. And we serve and say, hey, this is what we're about. And it, I, I think it, it reflects. And then if people ask why, you go, it's Christ. He's the one who compels me. He's the reason I do what I do. It's not because I'm a Boy Scout or some do-gooder or, you know, have some guilt complex I'm trying to work through. No, I'm doing it because Christ did it for me, and I want to do it for others. Okay, let's bow our heads and pray. Well, I want to just take this space here and first just dedicate it to the Lord. You know, if we're not used to prayer, prayer can cause us to, our mind drifts, we get antsy, we start thinking about Father's Day dinner or something, and, and I don't think that really honors this space we're kind of dedicating to the Lord, so I want to do that right now. Holy Spirit, we dedicate this next two, three minutes to you, that you speak to us, you come in your presence, in your fullness, open up our minds, soften our spirits. Teach us what it means to connect with the creator of the universe. The one who died for us. The one who loves us. I want to pray for those of you who we've been talking about love today and you feel like your love has died. It's decayed. Maybe in its place there's anger or unforgiveness 
from deep wounding scars that just won't seem to heal. God loves you. And what that means is he wants to see great things happen. He brings his healing hand. He brings his power. He brings the uh, resurrection power for reconciliation to recreate love feelings that are totally gone. You go, how in the world? How can that happen? Well, you know what? It's something God does. It is certainly a miracle. So let's go to the Lord. And I just want to pray for those of you who are in pain. Maybe you, you, your whole concept, the whole discussion of Father's Day brings pain for different reasons. It doesn't have to be like that. God wants to give you peace. He wants to give you satisfaction in your soul so you can say, it is well. If you've never put your faith in Christ, that is the first step. That's what you do. You go, Andy, I'm a, you know, I, I'm a spiritual person, but I, I, I'm not a Christian. This is your moment. This is what it, it means to have a lifestyle of love. It means to say, I'm going to do it depending on God's power. It means that I'm not going to race after what the world offers. I'm going to do what really matters, which is having relationships that really count. I'm going to be real. I'm going to take off my mask. I'm going to find a community I can really be part of. If you have never put your faith in Christ, this is the first step. And it really just begins the conversation like any other relationship. Certainly we call it prayer, but it's when you're just talking to God. And God's so big, he can, he can, you can think. And, and that's a form of prayer. You can whisper it. You can speak it out. Here's what you say. Just repeat after me right where you're at. Would you say, dear God, help me to feel your love. Reawaken love feelings in me again. Would you say, I put my faith in you. Thank you for dying on the cross. If you've never said that, just would you just say thank you, God, for sending your son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for me. I know I'm not perfect, but you love me anyways. You accept me just as I am. And then I'm going to encourage you to pray about being part of a, bel a believing community. Would you say, God, help me to find a church. Help me to find a, a place where I can, I can receive and give encouragement. And I can serve and be served cheerfully. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for tuning in to today's message. If God is impacting your life through this ministry, join us in reaching others by investing today. You can give by texting your donation amount to 757-230-2110 or by going to vineyardchurch.com slash give. Also, don't forget to subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an update. We'll see you next week.